Let us remember we are in the holy presence of a loving God. The Pacifism of Christ from a Lasallian Perspective Let's begin with a story. The master violinist Niccolo Paganini once gave a concert. After completing the piece and placing his violin down, he realized this was not his violin. It was an inferior instrument. He proceeded to apologize to the people present. Not only his instrument, but his presentation had been inferior. He then picked up the same violin and began once more to play the piece. The audience sat in an awe-filled silence. When he finished, Paganini gently put down the violin, declaring that this was the way the piece was to be played, even on an inferior instrument. For this time I played from my soul. Christian pacifism is living from one's soul. It is living in what De La Salle and Lasallians call the holy presence of God. Kevin Seasaltz names God's saturated givenness, and poet Raina Maria Rilke calls the great grace of things. May I add a line of questioning? De La Salle agreed with St. Teresa of Avila that the bread of self-knowledge is central to the Christian life. A good place to begin. Ask yourself, what is God doing with my life right now? Where am I in the ever-deepening conversion process begun at baptism? Our daily prayer, celebration of the sacraments, work for justice and peace, and especially sacrifice on behalf of the rights of the child integrated into my being called and sent by God. As I carry out my ministry as a Lasallian, how do I live the maxims of the gospel? Is my orientation towards life? Are my attitudes and actions rooted in the soil of the gospel of Jesus? Do I believe that God has willed me to live in this time and has given me the gifts necessary for a peacemaker in this age? What is the difference between what I say I believe and the way I live? Repent and believe the good news. The Gap What Michael Warren described with such insight as a new sensibility flows for Lasallians from the light of De La Salle's double contemplation, God's presence in the maxims of Holy Scripture and God's holy presence in the world. Every Lasallian is called to live as a witness to this reality, for it is nothing less than the reign of God already begun in our midst, but not yet fulfilled. We are called and sent to establish the reign of God on earth. As we repent and believe the good news, we enter into the creative tension, vitally present in the gap between the already and the not yet of God's reign. The Gap The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have killed thousands upon thousands of humans, mostly civilians, and continue to name as collateral damage countless men, women, and children suffering from the most odious physical and psychological wounds. The gap. The slow, painful death from poverty is a poison flowing from the imbalance of wealth in our world and mostly children are the victims. The gap. Hunger, the drug culture, the death penalty, abortion and the consequences of global climate change create a gap between our call to be peacemakers, to be witnesses to the establishment of God's reign, and those who suffer in anonymity and silence. Entering this gap is to live in the creative tension described in the United States Bishop's Peace Pastoral as the already and not yet. It is here within this tension that we meet our God. Love is the distinguishing mark of Jesus' disciples, the example of Christ. Jesus repeatedly crossed boundaries to include what was lost. He encountered and embraced what was unclean to include it in himself. 
Christ's love led De La Salle to live by faith, to enter the fracture between two worlds. He entered the gap between those who built walls to keep themselves safe in their own social milieu while looking for their personal advancement, and the poor who were left to their own resources without hope. De La Salle experienced an unsettling transformation that led him to leave one world for another. He experienced a profound interior conversion, turning him to the poor. Like De La Salle, we are invited to enter the gap. We are called to speak difficult words to the public, to be prophetic, to cross the divide so that God's ought to be will not be forgotten. If we forget who we are and who we ought to be, we get rid of God with no guilt. An act of hope, a choice. In light of the gospel, De La Salle had a prophetic vision that hope for salvation was being offered to the poor through this little group of men who so boldly challenged him. The task of prophetic ministry is to nurture, nourish, and evoke a consciousness and perception alternative to the consciousness and perception of the dominant culture around us. Crimes which no one would commit as an individual, he willingly and bravely commits when acting in the name of society, convinced that evil is entirely good when done in the name of the common good. We know that association means for the Saiyans that truth, justice, and mercy are the flames of faith that fuel our lives. Christian Pacifism, the first three centuries. Pacifism was the norm for Christians living at this time. Origin of Alexandria in the third century, in a work called Contra Chelsum, defends the faith against the challenge of Chelsus, who attacked Christian beliefs in four books called True Discourse. We find the challenge laid against Christian pacifism answered in the following manner. And to those who inquire of us whence we come, or who is our founder, we reply, we come agreeably to the counsels of Jesus to cut down our hostile and insolent worldly swords into plowshares, and to convert into pruning hooks the spears formerly employed in war. For we no longer take up the sword against any nation, nor do we learn war any more. Having become children of peace for the sake of Jesus our leader, we do not fight for the emperor, although he require it. Justin Mata's words are dramatic in describing the metanoia which flows from the gospel message. We who were filled with war and mutual slaughter and every wickedness have each of us in all the world changed our weapons of war, swords into plows and spears into agricultural instruments. We who formerly murdered one another now not only do not make war upon our enemies, but that we may not lie or deceive our judges, we gladly die confessing Christ. Athenagoras, writing before 180, explains in a positive manner why Christians do not go to war. Christians do not strike back, do not go to law when robbed. They give to them that ask of them, and love their neighbors as themselves. Arnobius, writing between 304 and 310, describes Christian pacifism in this way. Since we in such numbers have learned not to repay evil with evil, to endure injury rather than inflict it, to shed our own blood rather than to stain our hands and our conscience with the blood of another, the ungrateful world long owes to Christ this blessing, that savage ferocity has been softened and hostile hands have refrained from the blood of a kindred creature. Clement of Alexandria writing in 215, the church is an army of peace which sheds no blood. In peace, not in war, we are trained. Official Church Teaching Since Pope John XXIII Therefore, in an age such as ours, which prides itself on its atomic power, it is irrational to believe that war is still an apt means of vindicated violated rights. Peace is not merely the absence of war, 
nor can it be reduced to the maintenance of a balance of power between enemies. Peace results from that harmony built into the human society by its divine founder and actualized by men as they thirst after ever greater justice. Motivated by this same spirit, that is, to practice the truth in love, we cannot fail to praise those who renounce the use of violence in the vindication of their rights and who resort to methods of defense which are otherwise available to weaker parties too provided that this can be done without injury to the rights and duties of others or of the community itself. All of these considerations compel us to undertake an evaluation of war with an entirely new attitude. Any act of war aimed indiscriminately at the destruction of entire cities or of extensive areas along with their populations is a crime against God and man himself. It merits unequivocal and unhesitating condemnation. The human person is the clearest reflection of God's presence in the world. All of the Church's work in pursuit of both justice and peace is designed to protect and promote the dignity of the person. We believe work to develop nonviolent means of fending off aggression and resolving conflict best reflects the call of Jesus to love and to justice. We should do no harm to our neighbors. How we treat our enemy is the key test of whether we love our neighbor, and the possibility of taking even one human life is a prospect we should consider in fear and trembling. Violence never again. Terrorism never again. In the name of God, May every religion bring upon the earth justice and peace, forgiveness and life and love. Becoming a Peacemaker, a way of life and a transforming praxis. Becoming a peacemaker is not just a moral obligation for every Christian believer, but rather a way of life and a transforming praxis that enables peacemakers to imitate God's own initiatives. LaSalle embraced this way of life in his vision for schools guided by the wisdom of Father Nicholas Barry. The only sure and sound foundation for these is an abandonment to divine providence. The schools will come to ruin if you endow them. The Abolition of War The duty of every Christian is to do the one task which God has imposed on us in the world today. That task is to work for the total abolition of war. The choice is yours. We know the story of the young monk and the holy woman. In their small village, the monk wanted to be honored and to be put on a pedestal. But the people of the village would repeatedly visit the holy woman for guidance and prayer. One day, the monk decided to trick the holy woman in order to have the people believe in his wisdom. Addressing the woman, he said, We know of your holiness and wisdom. I hold a bird in my hand. Tell me, is this bird dead or alive? Now, if the holy woman said the bird was dead, the monk would release it. The people would see the woman's failure and turn to him for guidance. If she said the bird was alive, he would gently squeeze the life out of it without anyone knowing. The monk questioned the holy woman. Is this bird dead or alive? The holy woman paused in a moment of solitude before replying, The choice is yours. The hope of our world, the lives of God's children whom we instruct, the gospel life we embrace, and our witness as the salians to those who look to us for guidance and leadership is at stake as it was for De La Salle over 300 years ago. So now, for us, the work is God's. The choice is ours.